Thank you, Nirosh, for the introduction. Uh, so um, my goal is uh, to dig in deep a uh, little bit uh, into the digital transformation. So even my title says something, I position myself as an architect. So uh, Sanjeev and uh, Seshi set a good foundation, so I'll capitalize on it and then uh, uh, go in detail about uh, the business architecture and the technical architecture of digital transformation. So uh, I call it as a digital universe, not a digital world because there are other worlds exist. So uh, why we call it as a digital universe? Uh, basically, this is a picture took in 2012, uh, October 22nd in New York City. Uh, what happened that day, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City and then the entire city went um, uh, blackout, basically they lost electricity. Uh, while people looking for food, water, shelter, they were trying to find places to charge their devices. So devices are really important because you need to uh, access these digital products. The second example is this, like if you unpack your backpack, you will see these type of stuff, like a lot of devices, uh, charging uh, stuff, and then cables, so and so forth. So we carry a lot of these things because we have to connect uh, with these devices as well as have a, a digital experience as part of our day-to-day uh, -day activities. So uh, digital products, basically, we can take a uh, uh, lot of examples. Uh, Sanjeeva explained a little bit, and then Seshi uh, explained some of the examples as well. So I'll pick one uh, about Amazon because it's uh, very uh, connected with uh, my day-to-day -day life. So we don't tell uh, uh, bedtime stories anymore. Uh, these are my two kids. Like they tell Alexa, tell me a story, and then Alexa tells a story. Okay? And then they ask about history and all this stuff with Alexa, and then have that relationship with Alexa. So Alexa, like this Amazon Echo, it came with a reasonable um, sound, uh, uh, I mean quality uh, of sound at the initial version. And recently they increased that uh, capability. Now they can connect with, it can connect with the Bose sound system. Even that small speaker provide uh, a very quality sound. So it connect with that and then we can uh, produce, um, uh, we can uh, play music. And they increase the capability by connecting Alexa with uh, a call loop, that's the latest product that they have. So basically, uh, you can pre-order. My wife is really interested about it. What the loop will do, uh, you go, uh, you uh, dress up and then go in, uh, uh, in front of the Amazon Echo Look, and then it will ta tell whether that um, fit you, whether it's match for you, and then based on your uh, uh, like dressing patterns, it will guide you throughout. I don't know the experience, that's what it says. So I have pre-ordered one, so let's see the experience. So that's, that's the, the, the real digital products, and then how we connect with our data. So uh, before digging into the, uh, the architecture, let's look at what are the digital needs that uh, the, uh, the customers, consumers looking at. So basically, there are four uh, things. Uh, first thing is it has to be personalized. Like we used to have this customized stuff, but it's not only customized, it has to be personalized. And then the information has to be real time. Um, uh, and then it has to be geosensitive uh, based on where am I. Um, it has to update my uh, information and then provide accurate information. As example, as soon as I uh, landed in um, the airport, I got, uh, when I went to the Google Maps, it said like all the London trans transportation information updated in my Google Maps. Like that, it has to be geosensitive. And then it has to be predictive. That's why, uh, that's how it can provide more value by uh, predicting information based on the, uh, the things happen earlier as well as how things will happen in future. Then this, uh, this is one example of uh, the personalized uh, geosensitive and real time. It doesn't have predictive nature. Uh, so a smart car, like uh, when you see the, uh, it comes to the reserve, reserve world level, it says would like to uh, start search for gas stations based on the uh, where you are and uh, based on the real time information it get from the, uh, uh, the uh, car and uh, personalized information provided for you. It's really useful. I think uh, when you use this app uh, continuously, it will provide you predictive information as well uh, based on where usually you uh, pump gas so and so forth. So that's the experience that I got from a smart car. Then the uh, digital environment, what kind of a digital environment required to run, build these products. Uh, so uh, I call it as a digital double. So you have the person who is uh, using the digital product and then inside the digital environment it creates a copy of you called the digital double. 
and then it connects with all the other ecosystems and get information. So to run the digital double there should be an uh, environment that we call it as a digital workspace. So digital workspace can be a phone, it can be a tablet, it can be a server, it can be a cloud environment where these things operate. So to explain this thing in a real world uh, example, I'll use this uh, one, this uh, dating app. So a uh, lot of people use this, especially uh, single uh, female and male people. So how the, uh, the dating apps works, basically we have our digital uh, double inside the dating apps and then each and every digital doubles talk to each other. Based on our behavior and then our interest, it does a match and then this match is better than usual traditional matchmakers. So people try to uh, use these um, applications and even the actual human sleeping, uh, the digital doubles are active and talking to each other. That's how uh, it works. So uh, the, the advantage is, okay, you get a better match, but uh, the disadvantage is you uh, miss your first date because it's already done by the digital double. They know each other. Uh, when you meet uh, each and uh, the, the, your partner, you will not, uh, you don't need to talk about uh, what you like and uh, what movies you like, what music you like because it has already done uh, in the uh, digital workspace. So then how these things will connect, you have the person and person use the applications to connect. Applications run on top of platforms and then platforms connect with network. So that's how uh, e these things provide a lot of values. I'll go in detail on this stuff uh, in my uh, uh, next slides. Then the uh, few examples. So uh, when it comes to web apps, like we get a lot of social network um, uh, related experience and then mobile apps are more into gaming and geo related applications because you need to, uh, uh, it, it's really helpful when we are the move and then uh, two side pla platforms we call like uh, some examples say she explained like financial services those are not shared services it will be uh, between the service provider and the consumer and then the multi-sided platforms like uh, health care because health need to connect with multiple systems to provide information for a, a patient or a doctor and then uh, citizen services that will connect to multiple systems and provide a lot of information for you. And then you have value networks, the things that we call like uh, smart cities and then Sanjeev uh, talk about uh, smart hotel experience and then uh, a connected car, the experience that I uh, explained. So those are called the value networks that uh, we find uh, in this uh, context. So this is a, a quote that I took from Gartner. They uh, were talking about think le le less about the fixed processes because most of the applications that we build uh, earlier are about fixed processes. Uh, they are uh, telling to think more about the dynamic interactions that you are having with uh, uh, different type of systems and um, uh, people. So the interactions are human to machine and then machine to machine and machine to human, those are the interactions. Digital transformation, one disadvantage is uh, human to human interactions are less because we always can uh, communicate with uh, the other uh, three categories. So the best example about this uh, more interaction, uh, Starbucks, like uh, why people like to go to Starbucks because uh, they call uh, from your name and then give you the, um, uh, the uh, coffee. Uh, so that's uh, why a lot of people like to go over there. It's kind of more personalized experience. So they started with uh, the app basically. They introduced the app. App didn't do much earlier, like it uh, helped you to locate the place and then find a, a store. Uh, after that, they improved the app to uh, c connect with the um, the, uh, the e-commerce applications that they are having. And then uh, it kind of uh, increased the capabilities by connect with other ecosystems like iTunes that you can, uh, you get a free uh, uh, audio to listen and then provide more information from uh, Wall Street Journal, so and so forth. So it's a very um, uh, uh, a digital experience that they uh, increase and incrementally by looking at their customer behavior. Uh, so that's uh, about the interaction on uh, the uh, digital transformation. So let's uh, get into the uh, topic. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, first I'll start with the business architecture and then uh, go uh, into the technical architecture. So even Sanjeeva mentioned about the, uh, there should be a good, uh, synergy in between business and the uh, technical side to have a successful digital uh, product or digital uh, transformation. So the digital strategy and the uh, digital architecture, like they influence each other 
but uh, they have to have a, uh, a good alignment between each other to be uh, successful. So the, uh, the company strategy uh, uh, is the digital strategy, like you can't have a separate digital strategy and uh, company strategy. Uh, that's where the, uh, the business alignment can happen properly. So the um, uh, organizations, uh, th this is one example, how they structure uh, with the digital age. So you have a new role called a chief digital officer that will work with the digital leadership team and then most of the time directly report to CEO and then uh, try to have this uh, a change and then implement uh, these practices as well as uh, products. So the uh, uh, business architecture, actually this diagram, we uh, came up with this diagram in uh, around 2012, I guess, uh, like a lot earlier than uh, these uh, concepts came. So uh, uh, we designed this for a, a bank and then it was working, so we tried to reuse this business architecture. So it's about um, uh, look at your internal consumers who's using these systems and then look at your external consumers who's coming and uh, using this application externally and then look at the current IT infrastructure and look at the future IT strategies because uh, it's not something that you should start from scratch. Uh, you should look at what exists and then try to um, look at what you can reuse and then build and do the change uh, incrementally. Then uh, the roadmap basically the first thing is understand the consumer behavior uh, because that's a must. Uh, not something that you try to push for the customer rather than understand their behavior and design. Then the second thing is um, uh, uh, the look at design the consumer ex experience from the outside in. Like uh, again it's aligned with the, uh, uh, connect with the first point, like uh, properly understand them and then push it. So even like um, in the technical side if you design an API, uh, if you can look at who is using the API and, and how they are using it, what type of application they are building, you can provide a better API than uh, design an API and ask them to use it. So that's basically outside in approach. And then the identify the channels because channels are not limited to mobile and web today. Uh, so the uh, good example is people, a lot of people play games and like this Xbox and PS3 type of uh, devices. So you can use those type of channels to reach to different type of audiences. And then again like gas stations, cars, all these things are available. Based on the, uh, the, your consumers and consumer behaviors, you can pick what are the correct channels and deliver this uh, digital experience. Then the uh, consumer data, uh, how, because you need to collect this data, that's how you can provide predictive information as well as personalized information. So the uh, uh, collect this data, process them and then increase the interaction with your business. Then the last thing is uh, it has to be uh, uh, linked and then it has to be properly gelled with the physical experience as well when you provide a digital experience. So I'll give you an example. Uh, so Jonathan Marsh is our uh, VP uh, of IoT. So he uh, lives uh, uh, around three hours away from our Mountain New office and he come, uh, comes to our office uh, on uh, Tuesdays. So one day he uh, didn't bring his wallet and he wants to go and access the ATM so he doesn't have the ATM card. But he got the phone. So the beauty of this, um, uh, the, um, the bank, it's I think Wells Fargo, so you can get a temporary uh, access code to access your ATM. So he didn't have the, he didn't, he can't use the um, physical experience but uh, the digital experience matches the physical experience and he managed to access the ATM and withdraw money. So that's, a, uh, that's how you have to look at the physical experience and then design your digital experience as well. Then the technical architecture, uh, so this is something I found uh, on the web. Uh, so this is not what we are recommending. Digital architecture is not something outside the, uh, the enterprise architecture. Uh, basically the enterprise architecture is the digital architecture as well. That's how you have to think and start designing this. So this is what Gartner uh, identified some time back, a three layered architecture, a system of record like they call it as common ideas and then a system of differentiation that is uh, kind of the unique processes that you introduce and then top of that a system of innovation. This is two conceptual so uh, we came up with a, a, a second level we call it as a level zero diagram adding a few more layers to uh, this diagram. 
So you have the system of, uh, uh, you have on the top you have the system of engagement, that's where the digital products, basically the uh, consumer uh, based products are coming. Then I name the next layer as system of integration, that might be not the perfect word, but that's the best word I found. Uh, that contains all the API services and proper integration stuff, security analytics and so forth. Then you have the system of record, like how you access data. Uh, legacy applications and then different type of data interaction technologies. Then uh, you have the um, uh, system of record where you store the data. It can be a cloud storage, uh, a relational database, uh, NoSQL database, or file system where you store this stuff. And then the system of automation, that's the DevOps, TechOps, and infrastructure related things coming in that thing. So this, uh, uh, the architecture, high level layered architecture we used in uh, many customer implementations. One is Fidelity, uh, they are using this. And then the next example is uh, Jaguar Land Rover actually. Uh, so Mark, uh, who's uh, leading the technical stuff, uh, Jaguar Land Rover spent one week uh, with us in Mountain View and then we came up with a nice architecture by uh, looking at uh, this uh, uh, particular layered architecture. So uh, some people like layered architecture, some people don't like layered architecture. So I came up with a, a kind of an onion uh, diagram uh, to explain this uh, with the technology. So uh, if we look at the enterprise architecture today, it looks like this. You have the services, data, and systems. And then uh, integration, wrap uh, all these things, and then uh, convert the services and data um, and the systems into a way that you can interact with that. And then the API uh, is the proper way to access these things. Outside that, you have all the security related stuff, identity and access management. And then analytics collect all this information, um, uh, what's happening um, inside the system. And then uh, you can add on things like IoT and all the digital products will use the APIs and build around that. So that's another way of representing how uh, the current uh, digital enterprise looks like. And if you look at the runtime view, it might look like this. This might be familiar for you because uh, most of your enterprises are uh, similar, uh, have a similar um, look. Uh, you have like uh, services or microservices, top of that you have different type of uh, messaging channels, uh, integration technologies, and then the uh, quality of services, security, analytics coming uh, at another layer. And then uh, the edge is basically the APIs and set of API gateways will run um, on top of that. And then you have all the delivery channels, those are the digital products that you um, provide uh, as uh, a digital experience for your customers. And then things like uh, DevOps, uh, continuous integration, uh, development tools uh, coming at the edge as a supportive uh, structure to uh, this um, architecture. Then the key thing is you have many um, layers. Uh, the APIs is the key, and I call APIs as the digital connectors because all these things will connect by using the APIs. But then again, people talk about business APIs most of the time. But today, it's not only the business APIs. When it comes to the UI level, you have a user experience level APIs. Then the business APIs um, uh, are coming next. Then the application level APIs that provided by different type of applications coming. And then the data APIs and uh, the infrastructure level APIs. So those are the latest stuff that really um, uh, add more value to your architecture and delivery, and so on and so forth. So those are the different type of APIs that we can uh, find today. Then the uh, next thing is uh, about platforms. Now you have architecture, you have uh, the select the technology, you have the business uh, requirements done, but uh, to be successful in uh, this digital world, you need digital platform because I'm talking more about this innovation and um, how you can be more agile uh, in my next session. But um, uh, the, the problem is like when you give more freedom, you need to have some kind of a control as well, uh, put in some standards. So platform is a really good way to put standards and then enforce the people to stick to those standards and build stuff. But that will not stop the innovation, but uh, put some kind of governance, uh, we call it as a digital governance, into uh, this architecture. So if you look at uh, platform, basically a platform is a supportive structure that increases the efficiency 
efficiency of a community, like community will be the digital uh, workforce that you have who's building this application. And then, as I said, a platform is a government uh, that will uh, put some governance on top of uh, uh, your um, architecture. Uh, so this is one example, like if you look at it, uh, 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 how platform looks like. Like you have a platform with some shared capabilities, and then projects will come and uh, connect, uh, build on top of the platform. And the uh, project can be a product, like you can uh, convert it to a product and deliver. Uh, so uh, the platform will have enough space to bring new uh, products into the picture. So this is a traditional way of uh, building a platform, a shared platform that will access by many people. Uh, and then uh, if you want to have a separate isolation, then uh, concepts like multi-tenancy can use in an environment like this. But uh, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the way some organization work, a shared infrastructure might not work. So then there's another uh, solution for that is to have a decentralized approach. You set the platform, uh, set the standards, and you duplicate it with each and every business unit. So each and every business unit will have a total control of the platform, but it will remain the standards, and uh, the uh, central team will provide uh, new standards as well as new versions of the platform to do uh, but uh, those things are kind of um, duplicated but the things like continuous integration continuous testing those are centralized as well as uh, things like user stores are centralized in this architecture so you can have a shared um, uh, services layer as well as individual platforms for each and every um, business unit then the, uh, to make this uh, work, you need to have a proper team structure as well. Uh, so this is uh, something that we practice with most of the digital platforms that we built. Uh, basically, one team is a platform team we call. That should have a platform owner. Basically, that's a business guy who's coming uh, from the business side who owns the platform. And then there should be a platform architect who has an uh, architect, so many architects depend on the size of the platform, uh, who will um, uh, architect the platform as well as improve the architecture um, uh, on the run. And then uh, there should be a platform specialist. The role of the platform specialist basically, he, that group uh, will build quick POCs and then increase the um, capabilities of the platform. Because one challenge with the platform, if a platform doesn't provide enough uh, capabilities, people will go and build applications outside the platform. So shadow IT is a good example because I, when uh, the traditional IT didn't provide enough um, uh, capabilities, people uh, went and built these applications in different places. So to avoid that, uh, the one responsibility of the platform team is to provide these capabilities and continuously um, improve. Then uh, test automation is key because now you get different type of projects built on top of the platform. Without automation, you can't make sure the platform is stable as well as the projects onboarding uh, following the standards. So test automation is a must and then there should be a team uh, working on that. And there's DevOps because you need to uh, onboard projects, you need to update the platform, you need to automate these stuff. So uh, DevOps is playing a bigger role at the platform level. Then each and every project, um, there should be a project manager or uh, in agile world we call them as a scrum master who will uh, do the day-to-day -day, uh, Scrum activities. And then there should be a business architect because platform team, there's no big business uh, requirement impact for the platform. It's basically providing technology. But the each and every project team should look at the uh, business, I mean the consumer experience and the consumer, uh, uh, the requirements that coming from the uh, consumer side. So there should be a business architect architecting uh, these um, um, uh, products. And then there should be application architect who architect the application. And then the implementation, n number of impl implementation engineers and integration engineers based on the size of the project should work. And then there should be test automation engineers who will automate the uh, testing of the particular project. So this is uh, that particular team will repeat for each and every project and based on the size and how your organization work, you might be able to share some of these uh, capabilities across projects as well. And then the uh, next thing is, uh, so the platform team will uh, release new versions of the platform with new releases, but uh, you might be not able to migrate all the projects 
because uh, there can be incompatibilities and then there can be timing issues, there can be capability issues that you might be not able to uh, trans uh, transfer all the projects into the new platform. So at a time uh, you might have to run multiple versions of the platform and then give some intense uh, incentive for the project teams to migrate to new uh, uh, platforms, but uh, uh, that's something that you need to um, uh, take care when you release these platforms that we can't expect everybody to uh, trans uh, move into a new platform when you release a new version of uh, this. And then the implementation, uh, now these are more kind of uh, theoretical stuff like how uh, uh, you architect this thing and then how you uh, uh, design this thing. So implementation basically uh, is about, it, that's the, uh, the, the talk that I'll be doing in the afternoon, uh, going in detail about how you implement these uh, two architecture, business architecture and the uh, technical architecture in a practical or a pragmatic way. So I would like to uh, uh, take a few questions and finish my talk with this code that I got. Uh, usually we put like uh, uh, quotes from the technical uh, people, but uh, this I found uh, from, I think she's local, right? So uh, she said about this, like about the innovation and how you can change the world by uh, thinking uh, out of the box and then um, uh, have a uh, powerful, uh, provide a very uh, a good impact to your uh, system. Um, any questions? <laughs> Do you provide any guidelines on building the, these platforms? Uh, yeah, so it, it's uh, depend on your domain. Uh, so the, there are like there are some set of concepts, like uh, set of practices. That's about uh, the next talk. I will go in detail. But uh, fundamental stuff, yes, like uh, how you sh where should you start and then what type of standard that you uh, put and then uh, standards like, um, uh, so like uh, as a one example, like we usually tell the customers not to directly expose the services uh, for the consumers. Uh, always use the API layer uh, to go to the consumers, have a proper secure and then manage uh, way of providing your services. And then uh, like, um, uh, then the standards that you should use, uh, because uh, as example, you should always use a token to uh, uh, consume the API. That's the only way we can track who's using and then how they are using. Like that uh, usage-wise guidelines we provide as well as the implementation level guidelines we provide. And especially we engage a lot at the architecture level and then uh, guide most of the uh, customers. Yes, answer is yes, we do have. And it's more kind of uh, um, uh, customized uh, based on your domain as well as your uh, organization culture, how things work, and based on that, we provide guidelines. Okay, so can I assume that, let's suppose we are building a, a digital architecture for our organization, yeah. so we can extend your support to just to endorse that or just to see the whole, uh, high level feedback from your side on that digital architecture? Yeah, so the, the two levels actually, one example I told about Jaguar Land Rover that we engaged from the beginning and then helped to build the architecture. Okay. The second level is you might build the architecture based on your domain knowledge and then we can verify it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, we can provide architecture support and we have a global architecture team heavily working on different type of industries that uh, uh, so, okay, we are looking for such services, so definitely I need to talk to you on that yeah. in between, okay? Yeah, so there are a bunch of sales guys here as well, so uh, we can certainly give you information on that. <laughs> <an> opportunity, eh? <laughs> yeah. he, he likes to stick to the technical parts. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm quite interested in understanding um, you talked about project teams and the roles in there, but if you're yeah. moving to a more continuous development of a product, yeah. how, how do those roles shift or what's your experience of seeing the, what, what roles need to be involved there? Yeah, so the roles will not change. The key roles will be there, uh, but the number of people who's operating in that role will differ from the, uh, uh, the project, basically. Sometimes you need more people for the first version, uh, if it is a new technology and then there are more challenges and then once you've done the basic stuff, it might be a smaller team. But in some cases, you might start small 
and uh, the second iteration or the second phase might have a lot of features so you need a lot of people to build that so the number of people will change and then uh, the uh, based on the technology like you might add new technology so that's uh, one part I'll detail explain during my next session uh, you might not have all the technologies uh, at the first phase so you need to include those uh, capabilities uh, when you um, kind of uh, using those things in different uh, iterations so that's no kind of a single answer for that uh, it might uh, depend uh, this is kind of a basic structure that you can follow but you need to change it uh, based on uh, what you are planning to do and then how we are going to uh, use it just a slightly random question yeah. what, what is your definition of a microservice <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so the, the definitions of a microservice is uh, something that has a single scope. It's not about a tiny or a small service that will be doing some specific thing and then can be isolated. And if, we, if you shut down that particular service, it should not affect the system at all. Uh, so that is basically on the um, runtime as well as the implementation level. And uh, the business side, uh, that uh, particular service can own by a unique business unit. So that's basically the nature of a microservice. Uh, the, the problem is two things came together. One is the microservices came as an architecture pattern and then the containers came with the other side. So it got clashed and uh, it help, it's helping each other but uh, it kind of uh, gave a different definition. Uh, by telling okay microservices should be uh, micro but that's not the case like uh, it has to run independently managed by a, uh, a single business unit and then uh, so that the, the performance is key when it comes to the uh, runtime if you are using a container based architecture it has to spin up quickly and then um, uh, uh, spin up quickly and then come to the, uh, the environment because otherwise you can't utilize the uh, container advantages coming from the container. And then uh, the, even the architecture diagram I put, it's a micro, it's a architecture built using microservices architecture. So microservices is a small portion of this massive architecture uh, practice. So it represents uh, different type of uh, service levels. Now even we introduce something called uh, integration microservices. So Sanjeev will explain in detail uh, uh, with, uh, on that at the end. Uh, so different capabilities how you can run in this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, isolated way and manage them independently without having less dependency to other services and okay, so forth. Can we say the use cases on the top? the microservices and then the API? Uh, so the, the uh, you can expose a service as a uh, consumable API, not an issue, but the problem is um, in a larger enterprise then you will lose the management and then unification of this stuff. That's why we recommend to have the microservices and then have an API layer top of that. So that way in the longer run it's easy to manage. Uh, technically, there are no limitations. You can do that because you can uh, secure the endpoint using OAuth and then uh, do those stuff. But then again, it doesn't provide a proper API management um, experience that uh, things might not list in a marketplace and so forth. So uh, it's basically the experience as well as the control and the governance. So the recommendation is to have an API layer on top of that, but it doesn't limit. Uh, the uh, uh, microservices as well as there are concepts like uh, API composition that you will uh, the services you don't need to rewrite the services you can change the API layer and then um, have a different uh, uh, API that can provide for your consumer so and so forth uh, so it's a recommendation but uh, practically you can yeah can do that as well. The thing is you need a heavy services group if you do that, like if you directly expose the services because you have to rewrite the stuff and quickly release uh, the services. When you have an API layer, you don't need to uh, go that uh, chain that fast. Uh, you can chain the APIs quickly and then uh, have a, a different pace for the uh, uh, services as well. 